Um, <clears throat> the reason I chose, I decided to give this talk today is uh, it's part of actually a special issue that I'm coordinating, I'm editing for our journal. Again, I'm on the editorial board and uh, it's called Machines and Measure. And in fact, it's come out of um, one of the events that I ran in the CSC South group um, called Machines and Measure, as I've said. And so at that event, we had different uh, people speaking about uh, technology and work and uh, the ways that, again, capitalism is has become uh, subject to a, a, and, and quite an agent for uh, creating conditions for work that are around technological uh, means tech and productive uh, capacities. And so what kinds of machines are being used? What is the articulation around the integration of specific kinds of either computers or machinic technologies or in the case here of, of applications and tools that are linked with artificial intelligence. So I thought, because this is a paper that I have done for uh, for the special issue with another colleague at Rosa Luxemburg, um, we, are, we are putting this one together to, to ask the kinds of questions with the integration of artificial intelligence. So if, if artificial intelligence is the supposed final frontier of automation, of production, then clearly we need to think through whether or not it's something different from the previous ways of integrating technologies. Clearly automation is still happening and on the table. Um, but again, what does it mean for workers when artificial intelligence becomes this hyped, uh, really researched, really uh, funded, really uh, really uh, promoted new supposed future for, for all of society? And, and I mean, it's, it's at the point of ridicule at this, at this point uh, with, how, with how governments are seeing this as the future bigger than the internet and so on. Next one, what's the history of discussions of intelligence uh, throughout work design history, because I think if we want to talk about AI, it's it's not necessarily something new, but it is being put forward as though this is the, you know, the the kind of, as I say, the the great new brave supposedly brave new world, if we can use this term, uh, for for society, and and so we're going to see uh, a lot of you know, uh, heightened productivity. You're going to see um, a lot of you know things why why couldn't we have already achieved these things during let's say digitalization industry 4.0 industry 3.0 industry 2.0 but here we are now talking about ai as though it's it's got this something new and, and something unprecedented so what so what i want to know is intelligence itself why don't we extrapolate from the way that artificial intelligence as it was designed during strategic during operations research in the 50s um so what do we mean when we say intelligence and what has it meant for in fact the people who have invented, designed, the engineers, the development, the developers, the programmers, who actually were coming up with the ideas that um, that feed into the dialectic uh, for where we supposedly have reached, and is there anything new and significant about the present shift, and what are we talking about then about intelligence, and then what is the artificiality that we face? So those are the kinds of questions going into it. These are just some of the other publications, um, whatever that, that kind of deal with some of my research questions. So affective labor, if it becomes measured by technologies, what does that mean for supposedly revealing invisibilized labor? Is it to pay for it or is it just to predict worker collapse? So when you talk about things like predictive analytics, use of algorithmic governance, um, in, uh, in looking at the human resource level of making predictions about workers, da, 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 and then what happens when digitalized uh, tracking and metrics are used for health and wellness initiatives when they've already been used in factories, then you have to feed back um, armband, the, the kind of finger scanner, these kinds of things that are integrated into the, the workshop and warehouse. So there's new ways that labor can be, work can be uh, tracked and measured and counted. And that's actually what that book deals with. And then this one is for the International Labor Organization who picked up on the new types of risks again and then asked me to do a kind of report. My latest report is for your European Agency for Safety and Health at Work. Again, risks uh, for safety and health, the digitalization but that one's all about artificial intelligence. So I've kind of been doing that at that empirical, practical level and then making arguments around it. So the quantified work um, sphere, so I'm saying that this is a new area of research. Those are some of the authors who have led, who fed into it um, and then the kinds of things that we're saying, surplus value. So there's a, a really, a, there are some Marxist arguments happening within that uh, field. And I'm try, gonna try not to say too much just because you can ask me some, we can have a discussion uh, but um, <clears throat> yeah, so the point, the argument, which I'm gonna give you, a, a, I'm gonna kind of give you 
the punchline first. Um, again, what's the shift of AI? What will this mean for workers when these exacerbated trends in quantification and measure uh, enter in this new sphere, which has to do with where accountability is even further reduced because what artificial intelligence has to do with is machine learning, which is where algorithms, uh, equations are set up to understand things about big data sets. So if you have big data sets about each of your workers, they come from different silos, from different arenas, they don't necessarily have to be something even computer-based. It can be things like steps. Okay, of course, so, 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 so you know, it can be your tone of voice, it can be how many times you use your phone, what kinds of websites you've looked at, and so on and so on. Um, but the artificial intelligence aspect of that is when uh, the equation itself, the algorithm itself starts to ask new questions and can produ produce results that would take, let's say, statisticians uh, maybe a year, two years to achieve. So you've got this whole new, again, reduction of accountability for management. Uh, you've got, so the, you know, the machine is much better at doing certain things. And that's where the intelligent question, the intelligence question comes in. So we've, we're giving this whole concept around intelligence to a uh, machine that is capable at certain levels. But what does, what kind, what do we mean by then intelligence and why is it necessarily, so it's something based around, let's say in scientific management, we understand that this is all around, uh, so the kinds of technologies existed, this is all around efficiency drive, this is all around um, uh, putting things into very specific, one best way to move. For example, in brick laying, so this is what the Gelbraiths were looking at, uh, they were looking at in the steel industry, uh, which, which became uh, in endemic in fact across society, people don't really know this, but the, the kind of themes that come out of scientific management around compartmentalizing, categorizing, uh, started to be uh, rolled out also in banking systems, education systems, it was part of the civilization process. So again, what kinds of intelligence uh, were assumed of a worker? Well, that's clear, we know this, mental versus manual. The only uh, intelligent individual in the workplace was of course the designer of the work design, okay himself, and I do say that himself. Um, so, okay, so you have, and if you read the literature, of, you know, of, of clearly the stuff that uh, uh, Taylor was writing, so I have some very nice quotes. Uh, let's see, da, 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 scientific management, when handling a pig iron, principles of scientific management are so crude and elementary in its nature that the writer firmly believes that it would be possible to train an intelligent gorilla so as to become a more efficient pig iron handler than any man can be. Um, and the kinds of technologies that are used during this period of time, when again, this idea of intelligence can be taken from the gurus or the developers, the designers at the time, microchronometer, Thurbligs, the stethoscope, the stopwatch, by the way, Thurbligs is Gilbreth, uh, spelled backwards, and that has to do, uh, again, with the, the kind of one best way, the, the, the system of looking at how this ideal movement, the, the movement of the body, in fact, so is the ideal one that can create the pr most productive, the most efficient, the most work out of this uh, gorilla type being stethoscope and stopwatch. Okay, and again, of course, mental versus manual. I've been quite interested in how cognitive labor as it becomes something more in the human relations uh, period of work design history, so human relations here, and then so sort of over time you see so that attempts to measure, of course, cognitive labor, but there's a constant kind of the Descartesian, the Cartesian kind of dualism in how the body is subordinated consistently throughout any so form of intelligence, through any thinking through what intelligence can mean, the body is left out. Except for one interesting person who was Turing, who before any of this uh, wrote uh, in his famous essay, very interesting points around the skin. He says, you know, the minute a machine can have a skin, we can talk about the intelligence of, of the machine. So yeah, these kind of early iterations of, of interest in thinking through whether or not a machine can be intelligent and why are we con intelligent and why are we constantly using a machine as a reflector for humanity? What is wrong with our intelligence that we need to look at this mirror to supposedly universalize something. Meanwhile, we have discrimination cases from the use of algorithms quite blatant and making, again, headline news. Anyway, so here's, I, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, as I say, just because I don't have tons of time today, but here are some of the highlights for how I go through, even before any of the work design stuff. So Hobbes, who's writing in the Leviathan, when a man reasons, he does nothing else but conceive a sum total from addition of parcels, for reason is nothing but reckoning. So in, when you look at, again, the way that, that the mind is expected to operate, because of course, 
the different features for the types of technologies that are developed throughout time, which are neural networks, for example, um, and again, now we have the machine learning, but, but with it, neural networks were explicitly designed to mimic the way the mind works. So that's very much the biological side. So you have synapses, you have, you know, it's trying to take the cellular level and try to understand, you know, and, but, but it becomes this thing, which is also always, cal always calculative, mathematic formulaic. Uh, then if you look at, um, okay, I, don't, I didn't put them on here, but Boolean algebra. So this is uh, moving into the kind of 19, 50s, uh, so Boolean algebra, so he developed the binary code, yeah, which is on the, the basis for which all computation happens. Now, binary code is, uh, there are two numbers. One is true and one is false. So when you try to make the metaphor around human intelligence, and, and in his uh, early writings, he was very clear to say, okay, I'll get you a quote for this one, Boolean, oh yeah, I blew it. Okay, in the laws of thought, there you go. And actually, this, so he was actually 1854, but this is brought in as ways of understanding, uh, coding the, the algebra that develops out of it, but indicates all reasoning is calculating. And he writes a uh, variable, what did he say? It's very, da, 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 a couple of da, da, mathematical analysis of logic, 1847, uh, where it's very much around the calculation model that all of the mind, all the ways of thinking can be put into this very, uh, specific numer numerative, numerational uh, way, uh, ways of construct. Okay, and then we have the analytical engine, so that's even before that, 1835. Uh, so this engine being the first imagined computer, punch cards allowed for the operation of logical and mathematical computations. The, the word digital, as it starts to be used, is quite important. Digital is the Latin word for finger. And this is important because fingers, of course, are discrete units. So there are a lot of questions you can start to ask around the way things are measured, the way things are computed, the way that, that things are counted is very important in thinking through what intelligence can mean because of course these are discrete units and it's the expectation that is each one of them can hold a certain amount of value that might or might not be equal to every other finger, right? So it's this kind of set of assumptions that go into the whole developments of the technologies uh, so the choice then of like what counts really matters and so what's left out of that and that feeds into again we can talk about affective labor we can say again what can be numerated what is the non denumerable what is the quantified versus the qualified so it's a whole range of things and in this paper we're arguing that what you find time and time again that it has to do with productivity is the thing that's understood as as the intelligence um, that you know that the cognitive is valued over the corporeal. Uh, so as labor becomes materialized through this abstraction of labor, where it, you know calculation is used to identify errors, for example, in the warehouse now, to keep track of workers' toilet breaks, um, movements around factories, um, not so unlike the scientific management, but bringing in some of the other dimensions to do with health, supposedly, especially as this type of form of, of investigation enters the workplace. Okay. So just to, just to kind of end, because I know I don't have a lot of time, um, let's talk about AI uh, as the possible final frontier for, uh, I didn't mention systems rationalism. I won't go into the details of it, but it's again, this is the period of time within which artificial intelligence is first understood as a term and created as a term. And it actually was listed in 1955 in a grant proposal to run an event with some people at Dartmouth College who thought that they were gonna be able to get a computer to behave as though a human were behaving, as the same that would be considered intelligent if the human were still behaving. They thought, oh, we can do this in just a couple of weeks, just give us a bit of money, we're gonna have like a summer workshops, one into one. You can imagine the optimism uh, was outdoing itself and it did not happen, but there's a whole series of, uh, and of course linked with the cybernetics types of questions, but it in a way kind of wins, quote unquote, against cybernetics asking similar kinds of questions, but again, the trade unions were very curious in scientific management, what exactly, why are you doing these types of things? And then we go to the system interactions. Is, is this about worker speed up, work intensification, replacement of the human with the machine and so on? And again, why would we do that? And how is that understood as something intelligent? Um, so this is me just sort of putting through the different periods of work design history systems, ma scientific management. I'm, I'm calling the current phase agile because this is a term that has, a, I mean, I'm not gonna talk about it now, there's the, the Body and Society paper talks about it quite clearly, 
Um, but it's a form of, it's linked a little bit with human relations management. It's supposed to be all very horizontal. Um, starts with software designers. Actually, no, it started in manufacturing and then was revived uh, with, but it, and it has ex explicit implications for how work, again, is sped up through these different ways of, of understanding it, what's possible. Um, anyway, so putting it into the steps. So what is understood with intelligence, mental versus manual, motivated, involved, and then machines that are invented and what they're invented for. So that's a kind of a graph giving you some of that information. Um, okay, so I haven't really given you exactly the Marxist argument, uh, but so I'll quickly do that now. So what does this mean uh, for how work is abstracted? So we have the full arguments of abstraction of surplus value. Um, anytime there is a process by which uh, the work of a worker can be put into a form a, in a kind of a formula that it, it changes from something that belongs to the worker and then becomes something that again can be taken it can be used for profit for the capitalist and so on so that, that that's the kind of basic argument there are aspects around alienation where again you're removed even further from the product and removed from your community removed from yourself as it were from the supposed um, this kind of craft producer and worker, that all of these types of, uh, of computational methods that feed into, in fact, where we are now to think that artificial intelligence through the use of, for example, machine learning in the workplace for the, the use of language uh, recognition, machine uh, recognition, so facial recognition, on all the kinds of really intensive, explored, uh, very intimate um, ways of measuring labor now that can be then enhanced these are some of the problems I think that, that are faced by these uh, sets of, of, of um, researchers and artificial supposedly intelligentsia. So can we reduce thought to numbers and quantification? And in that context, how do we engage in purposive behavior? And, and so on. What counts as relevant facts? Uh, can computers even have wisdom and intelligence? And these questions that I've asked. Um, so OK, if you have the employment relationship, which, which is clearly uh, unequal, if you have you know, a system whereby workers do not feel they can meaningfully opt out, even though that's put on, on the table, uh, you know, these are the kinds of questions. How do we understand this in the context even of post-work? Does this mean people won't have to work anymore and what is left? So anyway, that's the paper and uh, those are the kinds of arguments that we're making. Um, and I, okay, so here's, what is this? Okay, so that's my EU OSHA report. It, it's gonna be published relatively soon. So there's a whole range of where AI has entered and is entering the workplace. So from human resources, uh, we've got cobots, chatbots, um, and gig work, obviously algorithms being the toy models of the universe. But, uh, and then the ways that unions are responding, what that means for workers, work intensification, and abstraction of, of labor and of surplus value in, in, in that context. Um, okay, these are some of the things that we could argue, computers and intelligence, what do they not do? I'll just give them because it's quite, quite fun to think about. Computers don't experience loneliness, they don't understand private property, because clearly that's part of the human makeup. Um, they do not demonstrate compassion, uh, although Eliza, the first chatbot, clearly had this effect. Choose decisions and choice, choice and, sorry, choose, so decisions and choice are two different things, this is one of the questions, uh, one of the arguments that's made, and then of course syntax versus semantics, which has to do with how we understand meaning, and can a computer ever do that? Now I've given you a lot, 